My focus today is on Isaiah chapter 11 with a special emphasis on verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the psalmist wrote, I rejoice when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now that our feet are standing within your gates, we rejoice to hear your word. As we listen, may your spirit enlighten our minds and move our hearts to love deeply as Jesus loved. This we pray to you, most holy trinity. Amen. Have you ever coppiced? Some of us have coppiced, but are afraid to admit it. People who know how to coppice can make a good living at it. Before you get the wrong idea, to coppice means to cut back in order to regrow. A traditional method of woodland management, coppicing enables new growth from the stump or roots if it is cut down. You cut the tree stump and stems down to about ground level so that new shoots can grow. The coppice tree is then ready to be harvested and the cycle begins again. Willow trees are the most popular because of their rapid regrowth. I have unwanted coppice trees in my backyard. Some of you have them too. You cut the tree down to the stump and shoots sprout from the roots. I learned that if you want to get rid of unwanted coppice trees, drill holes in the stump, pour in potassium nitrate, and burn them. Stump growth is quite familiar to Oklahomans and to Israelites. And so it's quite logical that when prophesying about the Messiah, Isaiah's prophecy uses a familiar image. Shoots sprout from stumps and roots bear fruit. However, before examining the prophet's message, we explore how John the Baptist practiced coppicing on the Jordan River 700 years later. John called people to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He echoed Isaiah's words, prepare for the way of the Lord. Repentant sinners prepared through baptism. Those too proud for repentance and baptism faced the axe and fire. So as a homeowner of a wooded lot, I know exactly the meaning of John's words. The axe is already laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Except I used a chainsaw before I threw the dead wood onto the fire. Coppicing or cutting down makes room for new growth in forest or in field, in ministry, in the military. Being cut down or being cut down to size is humbling and even humiliating. The problem of the Pharisees and Sadducees, chastised by John, was that they lacked humility and they would not repent. John cut down unrepentant sinners who produced no fruit. His message was much like Isaiah who cried, the eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride will be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted. And so like John, Isaiah called people to prepare for the day of the Lord. And so we return to Isaiah to see how stump growth is related to messianic prophecy. When God called Isaiah to be a prophet, we remember that an angel flew to him with a live coal from the altar. The angel touched the prophet's mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then Isaiah heard the voice of God reveal how his people would be captured, and how his land wasted. And yet, God promised this. But as the terebinth and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. 
The holy seed will be the stump in the land. Isaiah maintains this divinely inspired stump image growth throughout his preaching. In today's opening verse, he states, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Jesse, the father of King David, is an ancestor of Jesus. Son of David is a biblical term that refers to the Messiah. Thus, the shoot that grows out of the stump is the Lord Jesus. Isaiah prophesied the Spirit will rest on the Christ, the Messiah. And then he goes on to describe some aspects of this promised Messiah. The Spirit will endow him with wisdom and power and other gifts. And the poor and the needy, he will judge with righteousness. Now you say, well, that's all quite nice. But what does a 2,700-year-old messianic prophecy have to do with Christian living in 21st century America? What message do both Isaiah and John leave for us today? Two words. Wake up. Following Christ today is more arduous than clearing a wooded lot, more humbling than basic training in God's army. For the mature Christian, following Christ means humiliation, death, but new growth. In other words, Christian discipleship involves constant wake-up calls. An example, <clears throat> eight years ago this month, my friend Dr. William Katz, clinical director of echocardiography at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's Heart and Vascular Institute, informed me that my mother had between two months and two years to live. At the time, I was serving as a pastor and hospital chaplain in Eureka, California. I asked Bill, do you think I should come back? His one-sentence wake-up call was, if it were my mother, I would. Sometimes, following Christ involves not only moving, but moving out of your comfort zone. Moving from Northwest California to Southwestern Pennsylvania changed my lifestyle and added new responsibilities. Being mom's primary caregiver changed me, but in the end, it left me with no regrets. A more compelling example is from Congressman Mike Doyle of Pennsylvania. I met Mike, a member of Word of God Church, when I served there as a pastor in the mid-1990s. One Sunday morning, he spoke to our men's group, and a member of the church asked Mike how his life changed since he was elected to Congress. Mike's response was this. As a congressman, you receive a lot of invitations to speak to people. In the first six months, I accepted every request. During the week, I worked and lived in Washington, D.C., and on the weekends, I was out speaking to groups throughout the district. And then one Saturday morning, I was sitting at the kitchen table with my wife, drinking coffee and reading the morning paper, when she asked, how long are you going to do this Congress thing? I put down the paper and, res and responded, what do you mean? My wife said, I want to know how long you're going to do this, because I want to know when I get my husband back, when the children get their father back, and when we will be a family again. Mike said, it was like getting smacked between the eyes with a two-by-four. He continued, I informed my staff I would take no more Saturday requests. Mike, who attends church faithfully and participates in a congressional prayer group, learned that the mature Christian sometimes needs a proverbial smack between the eyes with a two-by-four in order to make necessary changes to life, to save one's marriage and family, to coppice in order to enable new growth. Advent is a sobering time when Christians eagerly anticipate the coming of Christ. As an infant on December 25th, 
and as glorious Lord and judge on a date yet unknown. As the day of the Lord nears, we have to ask ourselves, I think, three questions. First, am I prepared to repent or cut back in order to bear fruit? As I prepare for Christmas, what area of my life do I need to cut in order to regenerate new growth? If the Holy Spirit could coppice my life, how would that benefit the people who are closest to me? How would basic training in God's army humble me and make a better Christian out of me? Instead of watching Sports Center or Fox News all night, can I spend more time pondering God's word? Am I willing to share more time with my spouse and family and less time on Facebook? Second, am I willing to forgive because I have been forgiven? As we receive invitations to holiday parties and family dinners, is there someone there with whom I need to make amends? Now, you know that person because that person owes you rent because he occupies your head so much that he even causes you perhaps to sin in thought. Or am I as arrogant as a Pharisee on Jordan's bank that, hey, I don't need to reconcile with anyone. Who have I not forgiven as the Lord has forgiven me? And then finally, do I love with abandon because God will never abandon us? Do I express my excitement like a puppy? Now, we all know, those of us who have family dogs, that sometimes when you come home, the spouse or the kids do not get excited and run to greet you. But the family dog does, and it makes us feel like a million bucks. Why? Because dogs live totally in the present. God lives totally in the present. Every time God sees me, he gets excited, and he runs like some old fool to greet me with hugs and kisses. Luke 15:20. Do I love like that? Do I love with abandon? If not, then perhaps the biggest change we can make is to love God and neighbor with abandon, knowing that God will never abandon us. And so as we await for the day of the Lord, may that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.